Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone is staying safe and warm. And thank you for taking time this afternoon to spend a few minutes uh, on this webinar. Uh, you know that we today we are going to talk about the Omicron uh, COVID-19 issue going on all across not only Kentucky, but across the nation as well. And we do want to say that we did miss many of all of you all uh, last Thursday night. As you all know, we were supposed to have our Chamber Day dinner, which is a, a traditional dinner. We have the first week of the legislature legislative session, but with the COVID numbers being what they were last week, we just did felt like it was the safest thing not to move forward. And then of course, on that Thursday, we also had about nine inches of snow in some places in Kentucky, which would have made the dinner not able to happen either. But we are looking at rescheduling that in a couple of months when hopefully, I think we all can wish the, the world will be a little bit back to normal then. So we will send you those uh, dates as soon as we have them. We are looking at early March right now, just trying to get some confirmation. So we know many of you all were signed up to attend that last week and please know that we thank you for your understanding and having to postpone that but we're looking to march so we're thrilled today that you guys were able to join us and spend a few minutes talking about this important issue and getting some updates on what's going on here in Kentucky and so uh, to kind of start the program I will turn it over to our chair Diane Medley with MCM. Uh, good afternoon everyone and uh, welcome to this webinar it's unfortunate that we're still discussing this, but we're very fortunate to have a couple of very important people to the Commonwealth on today. Um, I am Diane Medley. I'm the current chair of the Kentucky Chamber, and I'm also uh, the executive chairman of MCM CPAs and Advisors in Louisville, Lexington, Cincinnati, Indianapolis. And if this is a very important topic for us. Uh, we have over 350 employees that are anxious about all of this as our, our leadership is. So it's very important to most of you out there or you would not be on this call. But I am happy to introduce uh, Dr. Stephen Stack. He's uh, well known to all of us over the last two years uh, because he's been helping us through this um, as best any of us can. So he's going to be starting our program. And as Ashley said, as soon as the governor is available, he will be joining us as well. And I think we will take some questions at the end and hopefully you can do that through chat or um, I think that's the, the method we're gonna be using. But I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Stack now and let him start with his current thoughts on our latest situation. Well, thank, thank you very much, Diane and Ashley. It's nice to be here, and thanks to all of you for making time for us to have uh, some time to discuss and re uh, respond to your questions. So as they've already mentioned, the governor's finishing a press conference. As soon as he joins, I'll step into the background and then play a supporting role. Uh, but where we are with Omicron, first of all, we are in a very, very different place now than we were when this started in 2020. The vaccines have really been game changers. So at this point in time, if you get vaccinated and if you are eligible, which is now for anyone 18 and older, five months after your second dose of a vaccine uh, or your first dose of Johnson & Johnson, if you get boosted, the likelihood of you getting severe illness and ending up in a hospital or unfortunately dying from the disease is remarkably, remarkably low compared to what it would have been two years ago. So we are not at all in the same place. And for all of you who are running businesses, which is pretty much everyone on this call, if you remember back to the times when we didn't know much about the disease, when we didn't know what steps to take, when we had to take uh, very broad-based steps to try to minimize the spread of the disease, we had uh, times where the wiping of every surface, the wearing of gloves in certain settings, the um, uh, uh, plexiglass barriers, but there are all sorts of additional measures and steps that were put in place to try to minimize the spread of a disease about which we knew very little and for which we had very little treatment or prevention other than minimizing human to human contact. We are not in that place right now. The vaccines make it possible for us to get back to regular activities in large part. And now the guidance is much more focused. It really boils down to please get vaccinated or get boosted if you're eligible, it makes a huge difference. If you are in a work setting where people come together indoors, please, please ask them to wear masks, particularly uh, right now during Omicron, which spreads pretty much as rapidly and easily as measles. 
Um, and if people are sick, support them in staying away from the workplace until they are better. At this point, regardless of what the infection is, COVID or anything else, we just simply can't afford to have people spreading infection during the middle of a pandemic. And I'll wrap, wrap up on this and then come back after the governor has a chance if he wants me to comment further. Right. This disease spreads so fast, so fast. It's the most contagious infection on the planet probably at this point in time. And, and the only thing that comes close is measles. It will shut your business down overnight. So it, it doubles every one and a half to three days. The likelihood of an infected person spreading it to someone uninfected, if you're standing close to them and sharing the same air, is almost certain. So if just to stay open, we all need you to stay open and you want to stay open, we've got to have people wear those masks and stay protected and follow those simple things about getting vaccinated, wearing your masks and getting um, by keeping people home and then supporting testing as much as possible. But the demand has gone up so much that I'm just going to acknowledge to you, I know it's difficult, but the demand is unlike anything we've seen even in this pandemic. So I'm going to step aside now and then I'll come back as the governor asked me to uh, later on, but thank you for the chance to be here and Governor Bashir, it's yours. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Stack and welcome Governor Bashir. We know you have had a busy morning. Uh, we were all just kind of following the press conference. So thank you so much for taking some time to join us, uh, especially to talk about this important topic today. And we missed you, like we said, last Thursday night at the Chamber Day dinner, but it was the safest thing to do in light oh, yeah. of the COVID numbers. Um, and then of course, on, on the snow on top of that, but we will be rescheduling that hopefully in the next couple of months when things hopefully return a little bit to normal. We look forward to hearing from you there, but thank you for joining us and I will turn it over to you. I'm proud of the decision you all made. Uh, the chamber was putting the, the health of its members um, ahead of, of, of the fun um, and the importance of the dinner itself. It was the right decision and I greatly uh, appreciate it. Yes, I spent the morning talking about the excitement of the future. We have an opportunity to make um, unprecedented investments in, in our education system and the workforce it'll create, but that's the excitement of the future. Uh, we wanted to do this just to talk to you about the, the dangerous uh, nature of the present and to make sure that you could get your questions asked and answered about how it could impact your businesses. Uh, when, when I asked our, uh, my group to reach out to the chamber, it was really about my concern um, that you could see widespread infection throughout uh, your business and wanted to make sure you at least had a chance to talk about different ways that we could help minimize that. So I'm gonna report later today, we had our highest week ever for cases at 52,603. Our second highest ever, to give you an idea, was 30,680. We didn't quite double it, but that's what this thing is doing. And while there are some that wanna say that this is just a common cold, our hospitals are filling up. I am sure that I'm going to have to send the National Guard to hospitals again and we're gonna to have to activate um, our nursing students. And we have the very real possibility, if not probability, that we're gonna lose other people out there who have strokes or in car wrecks or who have heart attacks because of how full the hospitals get. Uh, yes, if you are fully vaccinated and boosted, you're probably gonna be fine. Um, you know, it may be that you don't even feel it at all. Many people like that. If you are vaccinated but not boosted, a ton of people are, are getting it right now. Um, a, a ton of people are, are actually feeling sick too that aren't boosted, but not necessarily going to the hospital. But if you haven't gotten your booster or your workers hadn't, I would even consider uh, switching a large part of your efforts from getting people newly vaccinated if you only have a certain amount of efforts that you can take to making sure every single person gets boosted. The level of protection there is significant. And we're asking our education uh, systems and others to, to really focus on that. If you are unvaccinated, this thing can still hit you like a freight train. Uh, and we're seeing that with hospitals fill up. I don't have a number of just Omicron on vaccinated versus unvaccinated in the hospital since vaccines came out. Um, it's, it's right in the middle, 80% are unvaccinated. It could be 85 one day, 82 the, the next day, but that's waning immunity as well. That number was closer to 90% when we had, you know, the, the, when everybody had just gotten vaccinated and we're at that highest level. Uh, only 20% of our population is fully vaccinated um, and boosted. 
And so that, that gives a little idea of where we could be if we got up there. But I also at least wanted Dr. Stack to be able to talk to you about masks. And I'm not talking about in pe people's personal lives, but in your workspace, uh, because of how quickly this thing can spread. Uh, when I um, did the order for executive branch offices to wear masks, and everybody did but the other constitutional officers um, and, and another branch of government, I did it not. Uh, because of, of overall state policy, I did it as the head of a workforce. And since we have done this, we haven't had one major outbreak. Yeah, we've had different people get COVID, but we haven't had an entire unit taken out. And that's what we're seeing in different businesses uh, across Kentucky. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Stack if he has more comments, but, but just trying to give you and you all probably have it, but the knowledge, uh, the ability to ask questions, to do the best you can to protect your, your workforce and your productivity, because that's really important. I mean, we've had a record year, and we have a chance going forward to do amazing things, but we need all of you. Um, and I recognize that. We need your people to be healthy and, and productive. Um, we are working uh, on the workforce issue, universal pre-K for four-year-olds, which we would fund, will sure help a lot. Um, but, but with that, let me go back to Dr. Stack if he has additional comments or we could take questions. Thanks, Governor. So I put a link, I, I don't know if the audience can see that, but we update this weekly. The governor will have some of these slides will be updated for his press conference this afternoon at four, but this is the most recent one currently there. We update this on the web page, And uh, if you go to KY COVID-19 and you look at the KDPH data tab, you'll find a bunch of information there. But this is not, there's no doubt about this. Uh, the, the evidence is unequivocal. If you scroll to the bottom of that chart pack for vaccinations, 95% of all of the deaths from COVID since July in, in the Commonwealth have been unvaccinated if you're under 60. So, I mean, if you're under 60, COVID is almost 100% vaccine preventable death and, and shouldn't happen if you're vaccinated. If you're over 60, it's 73% of all of our deaths have been unvaccinated. Um, so for anyone who can't see the link, if you go to kycovid19.ky.gov and click KDPH data the, the, on, the mic, on the navigation bar, and then you'll find the weekly surveillance tab. And the weekly surveillance is the one that has this. The governor's made the really important points though. These masks, and, and, I, and th there is no debate. There is factually correct and there is wrong. And factually correct is that the masks work. The masks are not perfect. We have never said they were perfect, but they both reduce your risk of spreading the disease. They work particularly well for that by containing droplets to yourself, but they also have some more modest protective effect from you getting exposed to others. And when everybody in an indoor space wears a mask, that, that provides an, kind of an umbrella protection for everyone in that space. That plus vaccination, which helps the individual not get severe disease, also helps reduce somewhat the transmission. Although Omicron has spread so rapidly and become so effective, it is less effective at the transmission part, but it still helps a little bit. And when you get everyone vaccinated and everyone masked, we could bring this to an end. The difficulty has been getting people to do that. And folks, hey, the last thing, oh God, I'm sorry, Governor. Steve, we've got some questions that have been submitted. If I can, I'll just, I'll just read them to you. Um, uh, first from uh, OJ Aleka, what do we know, if anything yet, about death rates due to Omicron variant compared to Delta? And I know as you answer that, that also um, brings in transmissibility, amount of people who get it. So we don't have death rates yet. So here's the astounding thing. And I'll show, I think at the press conference this afternoon, a slide that shows this. Omicron has been a sheer vertical climb. It has gone literally straight vertical compared to anything we've ever seen before. The deaths won't come in for usually for weeks after, and then weeks and months after this surge. So we don't have a mortality rate yet. We are confident though, it does look like Omicron is less severe. And we would think proportionate to the number of new cases that there will be fewer deaths. And that's merciful, thank goodness. The problem is we are already, um, was it almost four times as high as our previous peak in terms of adjusted for population and we could go higher yet. So as a proportion, it's still 
will cause, um, unfortunately, a fair number of deaths from people who end up in the hospital. Um, the governor's, uh, oh, can his you, battery died. Are can you, you hear me? If, if the governor's screen said battery exhausted, which could probably be a metaphor after the last yeah. couple of weeks, I am sure, Governor. <laughs> so, so can you hear me? We yes. can hear you. Okay, great. Well, second question. If an employee, spouse, or child that they live with currently has COVID, should the employee stay home from work if possible? If possible, yes, because the likelihood of converting in the home setting is almost 100% because no one wears masks when they're around their immediate family almost. Now, does that answer change based on whether the employee is vaccinated or unvaccinated? If you're vaccinated, you're not required to quarantine. And um, so in theory, there's a little bit of a lighter standard if you're vaccinated. Um, I think that you still wanna be cautious. And so if they were vaccinated and had a household exposure and came to school, or I mean, to, I'm sorry, to work, they should definitely wear a mask for the next five to seven days until they get a negative test. Well, and I think that leads into the next question, which could also relate to the new school guidance that's gonna come out. A key component to productive workforce is childcare, amen. Uh, this person's childcare center is still doing 14 days quarantine. Um, what are your thoughts uh, on that? When the governor uh, starts his press conference at four o'clock today, it's our intention to release the uh, Kentucky updated K through 12 guidance. And we will also post at the same time the updated child care guidance. So that will all come out at the same time. There are a little bit of modifications for child care because the developmental stage of the children doesn't permit them to comply with certain things, but it will directionally head, you know, close, it won't be the 14 days, it will head directionally uh, like the K through 12 does. And, and I think we should go ahead and preview and, it, and it's in the CDC stuff a little buried, but there is a big difference in quarantine. Um, if, if a facility really, if you took the same guidance or a school has universal masking versus doesn't, because the risk of somebody coming back a little early and having the virus is entirely different if everybody is unmasked with Omicron versus, versus universal masking. So the school setting K through 12 is a specific circumstance, just like prisons are in, for different reasons and homeless shelters for different reasons, okay? So there's specific uh, considerations there. For the general workplace, if you look on our webpage now, right on KY COVID-19, right on the front page at the top, is an infographic that says 10-5-10. That is the guidance for the general public for quarantine and isolation. The thing that gets lost in the media coverage is in every scenario, the CDC relies upon people wearing masks either for 10 days after your close exposure to someone with COVID or for 10 days after your infection. Please don't get distracted entirely by the five-day number. 31% of people uh, are still contagious after day five. So the CDC is relying on people wearing masks in order to let them out of isolation earlier. The governor's point, and I'll wrap real quickly on this, is in the school setting, if everybody wears a mask, if all the people in the building wear masks and are fully compliant with that, our guidance today will share that there is no requirement for contact tracing in the school and there is no requirement for isolation. If you are exposed, so a positive student comes to school as long as everyone's wearing masks all day long, nobody has to quarantine in the school and you don't have to contact trace in the school. But that only holds true if everyone's wearing masks because that means that person is less likely to have spread it to anyone else because they were masked. The other people were less likely to get it and it's less likely to propagate because everyone's masked. So the same concept applies to your workplace. If you have an assembly line or a factory and everybody can wear masks, then, then that makes the risk of transition much, much lower and it, and it you know, slows the spread. Will there be changes to quarantine isolation after infection for long-term care residents? The, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid that regulates those licensed facilities has very specific healthcare guidance. They, they have been explicit that for hospitals, healthcare facilities, and nursing homes, that is their expectation that those healthcare settings follow the specific guidance for healthcare facilities. And the, the bar is still held to a higher standard in that setting. And let me just remind everyone, 
for the first year plus of this pandemic, almost all of our, two thirds of our deaths were happening in nursing homes. It is one of the most vulnerable populations in all of society. And so there are reasons why that standard is held higher. We have an obligation to keep those people safe. And while we are losing less, we are still losing uh, long-term care residents. Um, if by the end, uh, Dr. Stack, you or someone else can give the website for the current guidelines for isolation quarantine, I think that's at work, given the new ones will come out for school. Uh, I'll read the, the next one and I'll start with it. How are we handling the enormous demands for tests? as best as we can. We have a huge testing network, bigger than ever in human history, but the demand in Omicron has been enormous. It has been greater than anything we have ever seen before and even growing. So we are working uh, to expand it more and the federal government is too, but it's just the demand is so high uh, that, that it's, it's gonna take time. And that's unfortunately where we are. Uh, At-home tests, uh, do we recommend another test like a PCR after a positive at-home test? Dr. Stack? No, so let me, let me walk through this real quick. If, if you have symptoms and you test positive on, a, po on a, a rapid test, the assumption is you are positive. Right now we have positivity rates 25% or higher, meaning one in four people getting a test at a laboratory is positive. If you do a home test and it is positive and you have symptoms or a close exposure, that is enough. You should assume you're positive, treat yourself as positive and move on. If there are specific circumstances where laboratory or professional proof of a positive is required, that would be different. And then you might have to get a professionally done test where a healthcare provider either performs it or directly observes you. Uh, you know, clearly to avoid people falsifying information. There are, there are alternative reasons to either want to be positive or negative, depending on your perspective. But, but for your own health and wellness, a positive test from an antigen test is sufficient to presume you're positive. Okay, I'll answer the, the, the next one. How does masking influence K-12 isolation policies? If the masks being utilized are cloth, then therefore less effective against Omicron transmissions. Listen, I don't want to continue to argue whether masks are effective. Any layer is more effective. Better masks are more effective. But the concept that we shouldn't be masking in schools is an argument about people and what they want to do, not what is effective. Masks work. And if we want to keep our kids in school, we got to use them. I'm a parent of two kids that go to school and I lived through it. Um, and I get that some would rather not wear them, but they are effective. And absolutely, the math, the science, and the rest says that isolation, uh, that, that the risk to other students is significantly greater if people aren't wearing masks than if they are. So it's not just about you know, our kid, it's about everybody else's too. Um, as an employee of the 100 plus manufacturing employees, what's the status of the OSHA uh, testing rule mandate? I, I fall in that too. Um, it is being challenged. It is in front of the Supreme Court. Uh, the arguments suggested at least some skepticism from what some call the more conservative uh, judges. And, you know, it, it, Clark points out something that's very real. Uh, it would be very hard because it's not really a vaccine mandate. It's a testing mandate for unvaccinated individuals. He's right. It'd be really hard to, to meet right now. Uh, where testing is. So we'll, we'll keep you up to date with that, but that's, it's, it's a really valid point where we are. I don't conceptually disagree that unvaccinated folks would be good if they got tested more, but how it's done, um, whether it's forced, right now people are willing to do it. Um, so you know, it, it, it would be a real challenge to implement right now, one that we're looking at too. And one thing, Governor, I'll chime in. We've been following that obviously really closely for our membership. We do expect probably a decision here soon. I think it's one of those Supreme Court cases that will move soon. We may even hear something today, um, but we are a state that basically gets an extra 30 days because we have to, we're, we're a state where OSHA has to comply within the state, not the federal necessarily. And so we've been working closely with Secretary Link and the Labor Cabinet. Um, of, yeah. We would have an additional 30 days, which does help. However, Kentucky law does say that employees 
employers do have to pay for that testing. So part of the Biden ETS was that the, the burden was actually the, the cost of the, the test would be on the employee, the unvaccinated employee. Kentucky actually has a law that says you can't do that. And so the employers would have to pay, according to Kentucky law, for all of the testing. So obviously there's a myriad of issues from our, our perspective. So we're anxiously awaiting that Supreme Court decision and we will, we will let everyone uh, and all of our members know kind of how to proceed. Well, and, and the state is an employer in this one. We fall within the, the same as, as uh, everybody uh, else. Um, Lyle asked, uh, Steve, um, when we think that Omicron might peak, um, I know that there is, uh, at least where New York is, is, is significantly higher than where we are now. So, you know, these models do the best they can, but they're just that, they're models. And so, the range would be anywhere from mid, for the whole nation, the United States, from mid to the second half of January. New York started, you know, it was at the very beginning of this, and we're probably about two weeks behind New York. So I would say for us, not at least for two or three weeks is not, is when we would likely peak. I think we're still going to keep climbing for at least the next week. Uh, let's see. Do we know if COVID tests will remain free at healthcare facilities if a person is experiencing symptoms or has been exposed? I, as far as free, I, I don't know that they're all free. I, I think, first of all, I, I, I seldom use the word free. Nothing's free. Everyone, someone pays for it eventually. So uh, I think that um, they're not free everywhere. There are certain pharmacies. You can look on our testing website. You can find there are certain pharmacies who offer free testing supported by the federal government. There are a handful of drive through sites the state still supports in Northern Kentucky, at University of Kentucky here. Um, but for the most part, it's you have to make sure that you understand what the cost is. And, and if you have symptoms, your insurer may pay for it. If you walk in and say, I have a fever and a cough, it's medical testing. If you walk in and say, I have to get tested for work, I feel fine, your health insurer is not going to pay for it. So, um, Steve, can you talk about testing and emergency rooms? Really yes, important. and thank you. I had that. Folks, we need your help. I'm, I'm a 25-year I'm a ER person. I worked for two decades in the ER. People are going to the hospital, to the emergency department, just to get tested. They don't need emergency care. They are overrunning the system, and people with strokes and heart attacks and surgical emergencies get left behind. I need your help. We need your help. Please urge your workforce. Do not use the emergency department to get a test. If you have an emergency, go there. Yes, go there for an emergency. Otherwise, call your doctor, or if you just don't feel well, like you have an infection, you can't find a test. Just stay home till you feel better and then return to work when you feel better. All right, Ashley, I think those are the last set of questions that I see right now. Thank you so much for, for moderating those questions. It makes my job easier. So thank you for that. We want I'm, to be I'm working on future employment. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we want to be respectful of your all's time. We know how busy it is, and we just thank you all for taking this time. One last thing I think that has been the tone is obviously the vaccines are working. And I think one thing when people are saying, well, I'm vaccinated, but I still got it, but they're, you know, it's keeping people out of the hospitals and, and keeping them from obviously dying, like you said, Dr. Stack. I, as a parent, I have a six year old and a nine year old who are both vaccinated, but I know there's some hesitation amongst uh, vaccinating younger children. And I think we see those in the numbers that you guys show at the press conferences. From a medical perspective, anything you can say, Dr. Stack, to those parents that still have that concern about vaccinating their younger children? Governor, you want to go first? And I, or yes, sure. Right. Um, I have a 12 and an 11-year-old, um, and I vaccinated both of them. Now, they wanted to get vaccinated. They live with me. They <laughs> probably thought it was the, the, the right thing to do. Um, but I love those kids more than anything in life, more than this job, would give it up any minute, more than my own life. And if I did not fully believe in the efficacy and the safety of these vaccines, there's no way I would have done it, even with this job, even encouraging other people to do it. I wouldn't even go close to it. But I believe in their safety. In fact, my son's getting boosted today now that they just opened that up for, for 12 year olds. Steve? More than 8 billion doses of vaccine have been given the world around under the most intense scrutiny that humanity has ever applied to any pharmaceutical manufacturer the vaccines are safe. There's, there's no free lunch. There's always unfortunate rarities that occur in life in general. 
the vaccines are safe. That is another thing. There is no debate. There is only fact and there is fallacy. They are safe. I recommend everyone who's eligible get them. The risk to children is infinitesimal. There has been no child that anyone's aware of who has been permanently or seriously harmed in an enduring manner from the, the heart condition, the myocarditis, and that is very infrequent when it does occur and no child has failed yet to fully recover in actually a relatively short period of time using nothing more than some ibuprofen or some Tylenol. The, um, there is an article in the Wall Street Journal, uh, an op-ed piece that was there this morning. Unfortunately, that author has done what is a, a well-known uh, pattern of taking little kernels of accuracy and weaving them into what becomes a fallacy. The, the belief that because the vaccines don't guarantee you won't get infected, that there is not a reason to get them is false. Until we get to a point where our hospitals are not overrun, where people with non-COVID conditions like automobile accidents, precipitous deliveries, strokes, heart attacks, you know, appendicitis, people like that are in danger because there is not enough place and people to care for them at the hospitals until we get to a point that COVID does not overrun and collapse the healthcare system, we all of us have a vested interest in getting vaccinated. And we all of us individually have an interest to lower our risk. So, so vaccines are not required to fully prevent you from getting the infection. That's called sterilizing immunity. But, but most of them are relied upon to prevent you from getting seriously, seriously ill and requiring hospital or acute care um, so, so until we get to that point, we really all got to keep up this push to get vaccinated. Wonderful. Well, thank you guys so much. We do have extra questions that we will probably just email or call you all. Uh, thank you all for having such uh, a great communication with us on this important issue and whatever we can do to kind of help stop this spread and hopefully overcome this in the next few weeks. We definitely want to, but we, as we know, it's an issue for schools and for the workforce. So thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to our membership today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Bye -bye. all and have a great day. You too.